Welcome! Let's, let's start this over. I'm Pastor Derek, in case you don't know, I'm the pastor here, and I would like to welcome you. Um, we have lots of exciting events coming up, but first there was, we had an event here in the parking lot just yesterday where we opened up our trunks and we handed out candy to the neighborhood. And I want to tell you that it was a great time. I mean, not just for us being able to, to talk and chat with each other. I mean, we had kids fish or people fishing for kids out there. I mean, the kids had a blast. And I, we were able to touch so many families through this. So I want to say a big thank you to everyone who participated, everyone who donated candy and the like. Um, it was a great time and a great ministry to this community. Speaking of ministries to this community, on November 22nd, we'll be having the community Thanksgiving service. And we'll be holding that right here at 7 p.m. So I, I encourage you, invite your friends, um, invite your family, and, and bring them down so we can sing praises and thanksgiving to our God at this time of year where we set aside specifically to give thanks. Coming up on December 8th, I was told specifically to announce this, we have the Christmas walk around, which I'm new to this, but from what I understand, this is a ministry that, that we guys kind of take on. That we, we stand downtown and, and pass out peanuts and, and maybe cocoa and, and stuff like that. You guys are gonna have to show me the ropes because I'm not entirely sure what's going on with this. So guys, this is our time to shine. This is our time to show the ladies what we can do. So I need you all to step up and join us uh, December 8th. And finally, I've been announcing week after week that we are looking for a Sunday school teacher for our kindergarten, first and second graders. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I encourage you to be praying, to be seeking God. I know that he has somebody out there, somebody that has a burden for these kids, somebody that, that has the ability to teach these kids and to really speak into their lives. And so I ask you to continue to pray with me that God would bring that certain person to us. And with that all being said, that is the end of my announcements. So unless I'm going to read the snacks in nursery, which I think you guys can read all that yourselves, I would ask for our ushers to come forward. We'll receive the morning tithes and offerings.
life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender Savior Savior He can move the mountains my God is mighty to save He is mighty to save forever author of salvation go to prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning we seek your face, Lord. Above all the distractions of this world, Lord, we want to seek you. Help us, Lord, to focus on you above all else. Lord, you are our God. Lord, we lift up our burdens to you this morning. We lift up all the many medical needs, all those that are sick and in need of healing. Specifically this morning, we pray for Erica as she's going in for more testing. Lord, we pray that you give the doctors wisdom. We pray that, that you would bring about a full healing and a full recovery in her life and her body. We pray for Adam's friend's grandma as she's recovering from a stroke that, that you would draw near to her, that you would draw near to the family. Lord, we know all too well that it is not just the person in need that struggles during times like this. So we pray that you would strengthen that family, that you would encourage them, that you would give them the strength they need and the courage they need to deal with all that's going on. 
We continue to lift up those who are struggling this morning. Those struggling with family issues. Those struggling with finances. Those who have just fallen on a hard time in life. We lift them up to you, Lord. We lay them in your hands, for there is no better place to be. We pray that you would carry them through, that you would encourage them, that you would comfort them during these times. Lord, we know that you are the good God, that you are all powerful, that you are all knowing. Lord, many evils reside in this world. But we know that you are greater than all of them. That you are the ultimate good. And Lord, we trust in you. We rest in that peace that you have all of it in your hands. We love you, Lord. We pray that you would be with this service. We pray that you would touch each heart here, that you would speak to each person. Bring to them the message that they need to hear this morning, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been journeying through the book of Acts recently, and we're actually quite a ways through. I was just recounting it with Renee the other night and thinking, wow, we have almost gone through the entire book. I've almost completed my first series here as pastor. That's got to be a milestone or something. Way back when, before Renee and I even had kids, we, we had the burden on our heart to do foster parenting, and it's something that we're working towards right now as well. But in preparation for knowing someday we'd have kids and you know, knowing that we wanted to help others, we took a class at our church a parenting class. And there was lots of good information in that class, but one thing that was stressed over and over was the idea of first-time obedience. They told a story in which a young couple that had gone through the class, they had a son, he was about four years old, and they had gone through that class and they'd been working with him, instilling this idea of first-time obedience, listening the first time. They were doing some work around the house. The wife was in the backyard tending to the little one while the husband had to go up to the roof and was doing some work up there. He came down for a short break, and after a couple minutes, the couple realized that their four-year-old was no longer in the backyard with them. They looked up and they saw their four-year-old on the roof of the house. Somehow he had managed to climb the ladder when they weren't looking and was roaming around on the roof just steps away from the edge. And so they hollered up and and called for him to stop and to sit down. And immediately, the toddler sat. The husband was able to go up and retrieve the child. And as they told in in the class, if, if the child had not learned to listen to his parents, to obey the first time, the situation could have been much worse. The child could have fallen and gotten hurt or even killed. We try to do first-time obedience, but as people with children know, it's not an easy task. (laughs) Just the other day, our family went for a walk, and we we walked around the block, and and when we returned home, we were putting away strollers and wagons and whatever, and, and Andrew decided there was something out in the road that he wanted to go see. And so he takes off towards the road, and Renee and I both tell him to stop, and He didn't listen. So we yelled at him, Andrew, stop! And he stopped and started bawling, more out of fear that we yelled at him than trying to obey us. But this idea of of obeying the first time is important. And it's not just to keep us out of trouble. When we lived in Colorado, we lived in an apartment and we had a patio. It had a a glass door and a screen door, and right outside that patio was a tree. 
And Dylan wanted to hang a bird feeder in that tree. He wanted to be able to, to sit there and watch the birds eat. And so we hung that bird feeder and, of course, you know, the birds didn't come. And so he would, he would watch for the birds to come and they wouldn't come. So, you know, the attention span at that age, he went and did his own thing. But one day, it was a warm summer day. And he was back in his room playing. I was out in the living room and we had the patio door open. And I looked out there and I saw reaching out on one of the branches was a squirrel. Because, you know, they love eating your bird food too. And, a, and the squirrel was out there and it was eating the bird food. And I knew Dylan would want to see that. So I quietly called back, Dylan. He said, what? He said, come out here, quiet, quick. And I was fully expecting him to come tromping down the hallway. What is it, Dad? And, you know, scare the, the squirrel away. But, but he came quietly. And I pointed out to him, and he was fascinated that he was able to see this squirrel eating the bird food. We all know how important it is for us to listen and obey. Whether it's keeping us from danger, whether it's with our family or, or at a job or, or wherever it is. We know how important it is that we listen and obey, especially the first time. But how do we bring ourselves to that point? How do we bring ourselves to the point where we can listen and obey? Not just to the authorities over us, to our supervisors, to our mothers and our fathers, but also to our Heavenly Father. This morning as we continue through Acts, we come to Acts chapter 20. And when we left off, we left Paul in Ephesus. He was teaching the disciples there. And as he taught them there, the time came that he was to move on. And so he traveled across the Asia region, traveling from city to city, preaching and healing and you know, raising the dead, you know, the type of things that apostles of God do on a daily basis. But he came to a city called Miletus. And it's interesting because the scripture specifically tells us that when he went to the city, he intentionally avoided Ephesus, even though it was nearby. Yet when he arrives there, he calls to the elders of Ephesus and asks them to come down and meet him. And this is where we pick up in Acts chapter 20. We'll be starting with verse 18. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up, turn in them to Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 24. It says, when they arrived, that being the elders from Ephesus, he said to them, you know, I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He goes on to explain how this is likely the last time that they will see him. He doesn't know what he's facing, but he knows it's not going to be good. He goes on and he challenges them to stay true to the word that was taught to them, to the gospel that God gave them, charging them to stay strong in their faith and not to waver. I told last week, Paul was a pretty rational guy. I honestly think that he and I would have gotten along very well. He liked to lay things out because of this 
then this is the logical conclusion. He was a very sane guy. I mean, he wasn't crazy. He may have done some crazy things, but he wasn't crazy. And sure, as he traveled from city to city, hardships seemed to just follow him. Whenever, whenever he would preach, inevitably somebody would get mad at what he was saying. And on more than one occasion, he had to leave a city at night in the dark so that people didn't capture him and kill him. He was stoned and beaten. He was imprisoned. He was not a stranger to the hardships, but he never sought them out. And here we see him going to a place where he knew full well that danger and hardships were waiting for him. Typically, those of us who have half a brain will think, if there's a problem over here, if I'm going to go there and get hurt, I don't want to go there. Yet here he is, knowing full well what's waiting him and still choosing to go. And almost as if he knew that people would ask these questions about his sanity, before he even goes into what he's doing in verse 22, he tells them why. He says, and now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Have you ever had those situations where you know without a doubt what it is that God has for you? Maybe God's telling you you need to help somebody. You need to lend a hand to a friend or somebody in the church. Maybe it's giving money to a person or an organization or a missionary or, or something like that. You're sitting there and you just, you know that that's what God wants you to do. Or maybe it's taking on a new ministry, whether it's teaching Sunday school or, or leading a small group. You just know you can't really explain it, but you just know that that's what God has for you. Even in times where logically the answer would be no. I've had those times where God is leading me to a place to do something. And when I add it all up, when I think about it, the more and more that I think about it, the logical conclusion is, no, I don't want to do that. I don't have a good reason to do that. And the more I think about it, the more the answer is no. But the more that I pray about it, the more that I seek God and his answer, the answer is just yes. That's where Paul is. That's where we find him here in this scripture. He is well aware of what is going to happen. There is no doubt in his mind that when he goes to Jerusalem, he will find hardships, that he will find prison. Yeah, he has some business there, and you know it, he has reasons to go there, but he could send somebody else. He has no logical reason to go into these hardships, to go to Jerusalem knowing what he will be facing. But the more he prays about it, the more he seeks God, the more he knows that he needs to go. See, this is where we come full circle because there is a big difference between knowing God's will for our lives, knowing what God wants us to do, and doing God's will. There's a big difference in our lives between knowing we should do this, knowing I should go out and exercise more, I should not go out for ice cream, and doing it. There's a big difference. When you're a four-year-old on that roof, and God tells you to sit down, and you do it. No questions asked. But why? Why do we do that? Why does, why does a child obey their parents? Why do they do what their parents say without questioning? Why do, you, why do you do what your supervisor tells you? 
Why did Paul follow the leading of the Spirit to Jerusalem, even though he knew the hardships that he would be facing? It all comes down to one simple word. Trust. He knew where God was leading him, and he knew that he didn't want to go there. But he also knew that the one guiding him was trustworthy and faithful. He said, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He trusted in God. He trusted in God's mission. Now, I've grown up in the Church of the Nazarene. I started attending when I was about eight years old. And so growing up, I went through children's quizzing. I went through all the youth activities. I went through caravans. And if you're not familiar with caravans, it's, it's our version of Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and, and all that stuff. And to this day, I still remember the caravan motto. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Now today they don't say it in King James. That's what we did way back when. But the message is still the same. If we trust in God... If we rely on him, he will direct us. He will guide us down that path. In our lives, things are going to happen. Good things, bad things, things in between. Things that we don't necessarily understand. But through it all, there is one thing that is consistent. Our God is trustworthy. Our God is faithful. Paul knew where God was leading him. And he knew what awaited him there. Yet he was compelled to go. He was compelled to go towards the trials, to go towards the hardships. Because he trusted in the one who was leading him. I have to tell you, when you come to that point, it is, it's a whole new ball game. It is an adventure, stepping out on faith, following God wherever he leads, maybe not knowing where that is or knowing that logically it doesn't make sense to go there. But as we talked about last week, It's something different and spectacular. When you let God control your life, when you surrender it all to Him, giving it over to Him, signing the bottom of a blank contract and letting God fill in the details later. You don't know where you're going or how you'll get there. But you trust in the One who will guide you. And I can tell you from experience, when you do this, when you trust him, when you let him decide where you're going, when you tell him yes, before you even know what he's asking, it is a great adventure, scary at times, but a great rewarding adventure. But the question is, are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to take that step to trust God, knowing everything that you know about him, knowing everything that you've read, knowing that you can trust him, that he is faithful? Are you willing to take that step and put your life in his hands? To sign that contract, to just tell him yes, no matter what, God, Yes. 
Are you willing to follow God's path wherever it may lead? It may lead to Jerusalem where you know that hardship and prison is waiting you. You may have no idea where it's leading. But are you willing to trust Him? Are you willing to follow Him? No matter the cost. No matter what. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, You created each and every person here in this room. Lord, we know that You are a good God. We know that You are faithful. We know that You are trustworthy. But sometimes it's still hard to let go of the control that we think that we have. To give it over to You. We're afraid of where You'll take us. We're afraid that we're not going to like it. Maybe we know where it is and we really don't want to go. But Lord, You are trustworthy. We can trust You with everything that we have. So Lord, I pray this morning that You would speak to our hearts that you would reassure us, that you would reaffirm that which we already know, that we can trust you. And Lord, I pray that we would lay our lives in your hands, not just accepting the forgiveness that you offer, but the life that you offer as well. Lord, I pray that we would each Make our answer yes. Whatever it may be, whatever trials may come our way, whatever hardships may come our way, whatever uncertainties may lie ahead, that our answer would be yes. It's all too easy to follow you, Lord, when things are good. The true test is will we follow you, will we trust you, even when we don't know? Lord, draw these people close to you. I pray that you would lay this burden on their hearts, and if there is something that they have not turned over to you, if there is some area in their life that they are not trusting you with, Lord, that you would put your finger on it. Lord, that you would make them uncomfortable. That you would shine a light on that area and not let it go until they give it to you. Because Lord, you created us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And you have a plan laid out for us, Lord. I pray that we would trust in that that we would trust in You, that we would follow Your path. Go with us this week, Lord. Guide and direct us as only You can. Go with us as we go back to work, as we go back to school, as we take care of the kids. Lord, You are everything. Pray that you open our eyes and help us to see that. Each day of the week, draw us nearer to you and to your perfect plan for our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.